Welcome back, everybody. We're coming up on 1 p.m. Eastern. I uh, hope you enjoyed the plenary uh, this morning, uh, ter terrific talk, and I also hope that you were able to uh, check in on the Golden Goose Awards. If you haven't had a chance, go back and watch those. They're really inspiring, uh, telling the story of, uh, of some of the scientists at NIH who have, who have really uh, made a difference during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, we're here broadcasting live from the AAAS Auditorium in downtown DC. And how about that really thought-provoking talk from Mary Gray and the follow-on conversation with our colleague Jessica Windham. Uh, just a terrific, terrific conversation. Uh, if you haven't visited the AAAS Exchange yet, I want to encourage you to take a look. It is our virtual version of an, ex of an exhibit hall. Uh, you can access it from the main page of the platform. Just click on the green Exchange tile. And we've got partners looking to hire scientists at all career levels. Uh, we want, we've got folks who want to empower scientists engineers and communicators to serve their communities in various ways. And we have folks who want to enable all kinds of professional development. You can even schedule time to meet with many of our partners live via video. So take a look at the exchange today. I know it's hard, there's a lot packed in here, but go check it out. So now I'm gonna to toss it over to Jessica to give us an update on what's happening on the web. Jessica? <laughs> Thank you so much, Sudup. We're at the second social media update on day three of the 2021 AAAS annual meeting that is all virtual. And I'm here to help us and remind us to stay connected uh, during this new setting that we are in this year for this meeting. Okay, so I just wanna start off with a few reminders. Uh, the first is here at virtual.aaas.org backslash landing. Sudip had just mentioned the exchange. You can access it by clicking this square right here. And we also have socially distanced mingle, which you can click right here and it will take you to a page where you can choose different chat rooms, so to speak, on different topics uh, that we mentioned earlier. And you can learn more about by clicking here. We encourage you to visit uh, these uh, these areas of the conference, as Sudip said, there's a lot packed in, uh, but uh, make sure to check those out if you get a chance to do so. Okay, so I'm going to go through a few posts that we have seen on hashtag AAASMTG, which we encourage you to use on any post that you share uh, about the virtual annual meeting. And here is one that I caught earlier, uh, hashtag AAASMTG day three. It looks like uh, Dr. Homer Drummond uh, has a setup here. And if you notice here, it's a screenshot from our earlier AAAS live broadcast. So we thank you for tuning in. That look, that's really cool. Uh, love the setup. And here we have Emily Cloyd who writes, hashtag Peppy Picka misses meeting people in person at hashtag AAAS MTG, but they are loving this plenary talk by Mary L. Gray, which highlights the importance of hashtag SciEngage in technology research and development. Uh, this tweet references uh, what Sudip had just mentioned, the plenary talk that was just on. Uh, we appreciate you, turn, you tuning in. And here we have a tweet from Ocean Networks uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time, which is a coming right up. Uh, Canada's new hashtag blue economy strategy balances economic growth and sustainability. Join CEO Kate Warren at Kate Warren in conversation with science writer Lee Phillips on cooperative leadership, hashtag know the ocean innovation and hashtag blue economy. And here is a tweet from Andrew Black. Uh, the hashtag AAASMTG can't get enough of these two, and that is Sudip and Holden. So make sure to tune in to AAAS Live a little later today. Holden will be joining us once more to talk a little bit about the sister journals. And just one more reminder about the live chat with the editors of Science Magazine that is coming up at 2 p.m. I know that says tomorrow, the streets from yesterday, but it's today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Make sure to tune in for that as well. And then another one more reminder, uh, visit the exchange, which is basically a virtual uh, expo hall uh, where you can uh, learn more about resources and hear from NINDS, uh, resources and opportunities for neuroscientists and trainees. Oh, and here we have one more tweet. Uh, this one's pretty funny. Uh, this photo from last year in Seattle at hashtag AAASMTG really captures my mood about not getting to run into the public engagement reception as Roxy, uh, which I believe is this uh, 
this quote unquote dino. <laughs> um, but still looking forward to seeing my friends tonight at the hashtag SciCom, hashtag SciEngage reception at 5 p.m. Eastern uh, later today. Uh, thank you for sharing, Stacy. That's all the tweets and posts that I have for now. Make sure to keep uh, tuning in to AAAS Live. And um, I'm tossing this to Sudip. Sudip? Uh, well, we love a surprise cameo around here, don't we? <laughs> okay, this time I am tossing it to Sudip. <laughs> Sudip? Thanks, Jessica. You know how to tell the difference between, that, uh, between my stand-in and me? Uh, I'm the one wearing glasses and he's the one with hair. All right, uh, thanks, Jessica. Uh, in a minute, we're going to head over to my colleague, Olga Francois, to hear about what's coming up in the next segment. But first, I want to bring Olga in for another conversation about one of AAAS's most impactful programs, um, our Science and Technology Policy Fellowships, or STPF. As we discussed yesterday, Olga's day job is leading communications, marketing, and recruitment, and alumni engagement for STPF, which is a well-oiled machine that has placed more than 3,400 scientists and engineers in all three branches of the U.S. government. We said that again. 3,400 scientists over the last almost 50 years have been placed in all three branches of the, of the federal government, getting a first-hand look at policymaking and contributing their knowledge and analytical skills to the development of legislation, policies, and regulation that affect all of us. Um, Olga, you have been integral to that for the last almost 10 years now. Almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. Yeah. And that's right there. That's <laughs> that's triple S. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, uh, so you know, the, the STPF program is approaching 50 years. Approaching 50 years. Uh, what is? Are we planning some uh, some events around that? There there are some events planned. You know, it's exciting. Um, I actually came in right into the 40th. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, it's really exciting to be around long enough to see the 50th come to fruition. And some of the things I mean, I know um, we did some outreach and talked to several stakeholders. And some of the things that we want to do in addition to celebrating is sort of honoring the program and the past and all of the contributing um, partner societies and also grow the program. So looking towards the 50th, um, right now actually, we are recruiting that 50th class mm -hmm. because it takes a while to sort of get in the next class. So all the recruitment that happens during 2021 is for that 50th class. So um, I'm gonna turn to the camera a couple of times and go shamelessly, um, Now's the time, apply, apply. But um, we are also looking to grow the program in different ways. Uh, we've heard from the alumni that now might be the time for a more formal alumni association. So we're doing some research and looking at the structure of what that could turn, turn into. Um, there are some, some planned uh, sort of capstone projects that the alumni would like to do approaching the 50th. And so those are things that we want to support the alumni in doing. And additionally, we're looking at growing the program, um, I would say, in some ways around, I don't know how to say it, development, financial development. Mm -hmm. um, the program is healthy mm -hmm. and remains healthy, but there are there is one segment that doesn't grow as quickly as the demand would have liked, and that's in our congressional placements. Yeah. Right? And so that's a great opportunity for growth. And we are fortunate to have um, Joan and Dr. Erwin Jacobs um, of, the, of Qualcomm, the Qualcomm founder, to offer a match grant for the S&T Policy Fellows. Yeah. So if there are any alumni out there watching, now's the time to give and contribute to the Erwin Jacobs match grant. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, so this year we have some over 200 placed fellows. Is that right? Yes. Now most of those are in the executive branch, right? So they're at the State Department and at uh, NIH and NSF. Absolutely. And there's about 39 who are in Congress. Right. 39 places. And we do that in collaboration with many other societies. And so I want to give a shout out to our uh, to our collaborating societies all across the scientific and engineering spectrum. Uh, they are wonderful partners to us. Absolutely, and has been from the very beginning, right? Yeah. This program was established with that collaborative, collaborative of seven scientific societies, of which AAAS is but one, right? Yes. And all along, placing in Congress, we are but one 
of over 30 scientific societies. And it, it only thrives through the strength of that collaboration. And when we're doing that, we've got 39 with the help of these collaborating societies that are in Congress. We've had demand uh, from up to 100 offices that would like to have a fellow placed in their office? Absolutely. And so the, at the beginning of placement, con congressional placement each year, um, our program managers reach out on the Hill and kind of solicit who's interested in fellows. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of requests. But because of the number of partner societies we currently have, and you know, there's, there's the demand, we just can't fill that demand, mm -hmm. um, which means fellows in con Congress they get their pick. They get their pick. <laughs> There's that other part yeah. of it, right? Right now, they get their pick of where they'd like to be placed. They're in high demand on the Hill. Which is terrific, right? But as, <laughs> as an organization that's committed to science policy and committed to, uh, to integrating science into policy making, this is a this is a no-brainer of a place we've got to raise resources and invest, yes. right? Because if we have 100 uh, congressional offices that would like to have a fellow, we have 39 so far, that's 60 obvious things that we should be doing right, uh, as right. an organization. So, so you're right, we're committed to, to raising those funds. Uh, thank goodness for, um, uh, for, for Joan and Erwin Jacobs uh, providing us that matching grant. Uh, it's a large one, and so let's raise a lot of money to go and, uh, to go and get some more fellows into Congress. And, and you know, this is, I, I started my time in DC uh, in, uh, in not the SDPF fellowship, I don't think I would have qualified, uh, but in another, uh, in another fellowship, and it was, uh, it was a career-making experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a I've heard that. Yeah, it's a chance to, <laughs> it's a chance to see um, what policymaking is like from the inside. Right. Uh, and then you can go back to the lab bench, or you can, uh, or you can grow a career in, in policy or in business and a whole bunch of other things. No, it's a great point, because I yeah. hear that all the time, and I get that question, right? What do fellows go on to do? And um, I always say, like, the strength of the program is the experience of the fellows while they're in the program, but also what they go on to do after the program. Um, and our fellows go on in all sectors, they right? Do. And they continually make us proud. Yeah, yeah. We have some in the business sector. We have some some former congressmen. Uh, we have uh, uh, former CEOs as well. So it's a it's a terrific a terrific group of alumni to join. So if you are thinking about it, uh, talk to Olga, talk to the SDPF <laughs> community, uh, and if you are interested in helping support uh, getting those additional sixty fellows into Congress, why wouldn't we do that? Uh, uh, please uh, please talk to us. Uh, Thanks, Olga. That was a great conversation about no, this No, thank you for giving us the opportunity. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal, and you're right in the middle of it. Thank you. Um, well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, coming up later on this channel, we'll hear about a typical day in the life of a AAAS S&T Policy Fellow. So stay tuned on this channel. Uh, but now, let's hear more about what's in store for the rest of today. Olga? All right, now back to my current daytime. Um, you know, I always love an opportunity to talk about STPF, but that is not the only reason why we're here. Um, back to the sessions du jour. For those enrolled for the scientific sessions, we have two great topical lectures getting underway at 1 p.m. Eastern. From Nalini, Nakarnani, Forest, the Earth, and Ourselves, Understanding Dynamic Systems Through an Interdisciplinary Lens. From Yalidi, Matos, The American Dream, Understanding White American Support for the DREAM Act and Punitive Immigration Policies. Also starting at 1 p.m. Eastern is the George Sarton Memorial Lecture in the History of Philosophy of Science. Luis Campos' lecture is called Pandora's Pandemic, Infectious Futures at the Dawn of Genetic Engineering. There's an exchange event also beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern from Arizona State University, LIDAR mapping of Maya archaeology and environmental change, a game changer. You can also join a special session on this channel at 1 p.m. Eastern from the AAAS and the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, empowering the next generation to shape the future of American science policy. Then at 2 p.m. Eastern, check out four more great exchange events from AAAS, getting more evidence into the news, how Sciline works with scientists. As a discussion-based session, this is first come, first serve. 
from the science family of journals, Ask the Editors, featuring Valda Vinson, Jake Yeston, and Lisa Chong. This is a great opportunity to interact with the editors who lead science across multiple disciplines. From Arizona State University, Maya Ag Aquaculture, past and present, dynamic floodplain ecology, fish capture and domesticated waterscapes, and Minsabak, Chiapas, Mexico. And from the Government of Canada, study, work, explore, and stay in Canada. Rounding out the 2 p.m. Eastern hour are three e-poster discussions, sessions, lie mining community, aquifer interactions, and Salar de Atacama, an agent-based model, mulch as a crop management tool in wild blueberries, and why does Russia have a higher abortion rate than other post-Soviet countries? Now back to you, Suda. Wow, what an, in, what an incredible uh, number of choices. Um, so a few words now for our topical speakers, or um, I think we wanna get directly to our topical speakers. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves as we go straight into these sessions. It's one o'clock, this is a big deal day. Uh, enjoy it and we'll be back with you in a little while. Thank you.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you could make it for this special presentation of results from the comprehensive evaluation of the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program. My name is Jennifer Pearl, and I'm the director of the STPF program, and as well, a 2002-2003 STPF fellow. With me today is Dr. Karen Garris. Dr. Garris is a senior research associate with the Goodman Research Group, and she conducted the study for us. We'll start off with a short presentation and then go to questions from you. You don't need to wait till the end to enter your question. Click the question box in your menu and type your question in. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, and before we begin the flow, I'd like to express some thanks to several of the STPF staff who helped make this webinar a possibility today. So thanks especially to Kat Song and Zach Everett, and also to Mike Wheeler and Olga Francois. So to give you a preview of what the webinar will consist of today, um, our title is Bringing Scientists to the Federal Government, How Well Does It Work? We'll talk about the rationale for the study and the methods that were used. We'll go over some key findings and areas for improvement, and then we'll do some Q&A. One of AAAS's earliest and strongest um, efforts to bring evidence to decision makers is the Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program. Our mission is to connect science with policy and foster a network of science and engineering leaders who understand government and policy making and are prepared to develop and execute solutions to address societal challenges. This year, the fellowship has about 270 fellows in it, and you can see a picture of the current class below. Just as we want our fellows to bring a data-driven mindset to the federal government, we as a program want to be data-driven as well. Conducting an evaluation done by an expert external body is one way to get the data we need to help identify our areas of program improvement and tell our story better to all of our stakeholders, our current funders, future funders, alumni, potential applicants, offices and agencies, post fellows. Um, Karen, would you like to talk about the next few slides? Sure. Uh, so the evaluation was aimed to, uh, to look at the impact of the program, both on fellows as well as on the mentors and host offices that hosted the fellows. So uh, this slide shows you the key outcomes that we looked at. So for fellows, we were looking at the growth in their understanding of how public policy on science and technology is formulated and implemented. Uh, we also measured uh, knowledge and skills in the areas of science and technology policy. We looked also at longer-term uh, longer influences on fellows' careers after participating in the fellowship, uh, including some of the professional activities and leadership experiences that they, um, that they did after the fellowship. Uh, for the mentors and host offices, the primary thing we were looking at was the impact of the fellow contributions to the work of the office. So basically the value added that the fellows were bringing with their expertise uh, and scientific knowledge. So there were a couple of parts to um, a couple of pieces to the evaluation. So one of the things that I did is to review um, a bunch of materials program materials. We also conducted primarily um, most of the data that we're going to be talking about today come from surveys. Um, we surveyed alumni from all cohorts of the fellowship going back to 1973. Uh, we ended up getting a pretty good response rate from them. So we, the response rate was 46% of the alumni that we invited responded and that was a total of 1,261 alums. Uh, we also surveyed mentors from the past five cohorts, uh, and there the response rate was about 38%. We got 235 mentors to fill out the survey. Uh, and then to sort of flesh out the findings from the quantitative, primarily quantitative survey, we actually conducted interviews with randomly selected samples of alums and mentors. Um, so we interviewed 24 alums and 14 mentors. We tried to get, the, the point of randomly selecting them was to try and get good representation across different offices and years and so on. Uh, I also interviewed key program staff at AAAS, so we conducted seven staff interviews as well.
Okay, and then just a description. Um, what we, what uh, the, from the fellows who were surveyed, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who they were and about the placements that they had. Uh, the most common discipline, scientific discipline, among the fellows was um, biological sciences, which also includes agricultural and environmental science. That was uh, just over a third of the fellows. Uh, about a quarter of the fellows, this is the next common grouping, were physical scientists. Uh, the, the majority of them, 96%, had a PhD. About three quarters of the fellows come uh, as early career fellows, which we defined as being uh, in, in their postgraduate careers for less than seven years. So about two thirds of the fellows came directly to the fellowship from academia, uh, mostly as graduate students or postdocs. That was 68%. Uh, and then about a quarter of the fellows returned to academia after the fellowship, uh, but a, a larger number actually go into government positions. Of the alums that we interviewed, just over half were women, about 14% identified as a race other than white. We had about one third uh, who had served in legislative fellowships and 70% who had served in executive uh, fellowships. That totals just a little bit more than 100% because there were some fellows who served in both branches um, multiple years. Uh, of the executive fellowships, the most common were USAID, State Department, NSF, EPA, and NIH. Uh, interestingly, <laughs> before the fellowship, about 28% of the fellows came from the Mid-Atlantic region. 53% are in the Atlantic Mid-Atlantic region now. And now I see that my camera is frozen, so I'm going to try turning it off and then back on. Okay, so we can move on now to talk about some of the findings. So um, when we surveyed the fellows, we asked about um, satisfaction. What did they like it? We asked what they learned in terms of knowledge and in terms of ability. And we also asked about the impact that it had had on their careers going forward. Um, and so let me start off with a overall satisfaction rating. 89% of the fellows expressed a high level of satisfaction. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, we broke that down into different um, different components. Um, many of you know about our orientation, which is a hallmark of the program and really um, a great um, introduction to Washington. So the uh, orientation was rated quite highly at 88% there and then you can see going through the other um, circle pictures how the fellow the alumni rated other aspects of the STPF program um, now we also asked the alumni what was their objective in signing up for the fellowship and coming to Washington for this program and they had different objectives. They don't all have the same objectives. Um, some of the objectives that alumni cited were understanding the intersections between science and technology and policy. Others wanted to offer their skills and experience in public service or explore changing their um, career paths. Others wanted to advance in their current career, to um, learn to integrate policy into their own area of expertise, or to address policies of specific interest um, of, of, the, of them individually. And you can see how successful um, alumni felt the fellowship was in meeting those objectives. Um, an overarching number that's not on this slide, but that's interesting to note, is that 87% of the fellows rated their experience as very or extremely successful in meeting their own number one goal. Now, if we move to the next slide, this slide talks about knowledge and abilities. We want to, we, we hoped and um, wanted to see what the fellows learned in terms of knowledge and also what they turned, learned in terms of knowing how to do something, enhance their abilities as a result of the fellowship program. And these, um, these graphs on this slide give the average rating just before the fellowship and the average gain um, after the fellowship in some key areas. 
Um, the knowledge areas that we looked at are policy and science policy integration and workings of government, and we saw substantial gains in knowledge there. And then also in abilities, the two abilities that we um, that we tested are collaboration skills and science policy integration skills, and we also saw substantial um, substantial gains there. One of the neat things about this evaluation is that Karen um, got quotes from many of the alumni who filled out the surveys or that she interviewed. And so throughout the presentation, we'll um, pepper the slides with some quotes. And, and one of the neat ones that someone said is, I learned to translate geek into wonk. Um, so in thinking about the fellows' contributions to their host offices, we want to we asked them what they contributed and um, and how meaningful were those contributions. This slide talks about that data. Um, they made so you, if you go through the different slides, the different um, stages of the uh, of the graphs, you can see that their assignments enhanced their knowledge, and many of them felt their contributions were meaningful to the work of their host office. Um, later on, we'll show you some data about what the mentors responded when we asked them similar questions. So the fellows felt that they were really making uh, meaningful contributions. Um, okay, and we can go to the next slide. Now we're going to switch to, from talking about what they did during their fellowship to how the fellowship impacted their career and their activities beyond the fellowship. Many of the fellows reported engaging in specific activities that relate to science and policy as a direct result of their fellowship. For example, 76% advocated for specific policies after their fellowship concluded. Um, and just over half crafted science policy position papers. We also asked them if they had run for office, and only 3% of them ran for office. In addition to asking about how the fellowship impacted their um, science policy activities after the fellowship, we asked them how it impacted their more general professional activities after the fellowship. And this, um, this slide details those responses. So we have here, um, you know, 90% saying they gained a greater knowledge of career options. Um, you know, numbers in the 80s and 90s talking about gaining lasting professional connections, engaging more with the government, adding value to their teaching, advising, or mentoring, um, and um, a good number as well changing their career trajectory, although that is not necessarily an aim of the fellowship program. Many fellows take on jobs closely related to policy after the fellowship, uh, but even those who don't have been able to use their experience to enhance and augment their work. So here are two quotes um, from one alum who, be who became a scientist in the federal sector, um, and this person said they've been specifically prohibited for, from participating directly in policy making in their current role, but the fellowship helped to direct their research um, with policy implications in mind. Another fellow said, the knowledge, connections, and resources gained through the fellowship have rippled well beyond my work through the mentoring and coaching I do for professionals at all career and educational stages. So this, um, this chart that we have up right now is one of my favorite um, slides in the whole presentation because it reflects the um, career trajectories of fellows um, before they came into the program, after they left the program, and then through the current day. And we had always heard a lot of stories about fellows' career trajectories, but never really um, knew the data of what do fellows do after the fellowship. So this is the first time that we were able to acquire actual data from a wide cohort of people asking them, what did you do after your fellowship and what are you doing now? 
we typically do survey fellows who are completing their fellowship about what are your plans going forward, but the question is different when you ask somebody what their plans are when they haven't actually left yet, and then you do a, a retrospective survey of what did you actually do. So if you look at the left side of the picture, um, this, this uh, graph shows the distribution among sectors before the fellowship and just after the fellowship. So you can see a large proportion of fellows are coming to the fellowship from the academic sector, either as faculty members, postdocs, or PhD students. Um, and then after the fellowship, a good number of them are trans transferring to a government position. And these consist of government positions at the state, national, and local level. And then another question that we asked was, how does that actually change over time? Are they, um, as they go further in their career, are they staying in these sectors or are they morphing further? And if you look at the second, this is the right part of the slide now, you can see that, that um, many of them are staying in government sectors with a good portion of them in academic, nonprofit, and for-profit sectors, but you can see more of them becoming retired you know, as time goes on. Um, so now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about the mentors who were surveyed. The, um, we asked mentors about um, their motivations for taking on a fellow, and we asked them about their experience with the STPF program. So um, three quarters of them had been me mentors for less than five years. Um, uh, almost all of them, 84%, had mentored one between one and five fellows. And a quarter of them are, are alumni. And this is a really interesting statistics because we find that oftentimes when we are able to bring on new agencies in the executive branch hosting fellows for our program or new offices within um, in, in Congress or in the executive or judicial branch that the mentors are often a, uh, alums and they bring this with them to their new workplaces. The two main primary objectives that mentors cited for bringing on fellows were to accomplish tasks it couldn't otherwise complete and to bring a science and technical skill set to their office's work. Um, we also asked mentors about satisfaction. So um, the um, overall satisfaction rating was 94% in their experience as a mentor. So this is an extremely high satisfaction rating. Um, and you can see the distribution for other more specific items that we asked them about. Fellows work product, um, adaptability and flexibility of the fellows, the um, support provided by AAAS and by their own office. And here we dive into a little bit more detail about what mentors say about the, the fellows, um, how they fit in and how they're prepared to contribute. You can again see very high ratings um, in the 80s and 90s for, um, for opportunities for the fellows to be useful in the office, how they integrate themselves into the office, um, the fellows being able to communicate to diverse audiences, being able to take on leadership roles and project assignments, um, and really <clears throat> the mentors are giving quite high ratings to the work that the fellows are doing in their offices. We also asked them what are some of the specific tasks that um, fellows worked on in the offices. Over half said that the fellows provided needed expertise to help address a complex problem. Other common responses including tra included translating scientific content into more easily accessible terms, clarifying the interpretations of data and scientific evidence, um, providing data and scientific evidence to influence decisions, some summarizing scientific information for a decision maker, applying the scientific method to find solutions to problems, and offering technical input that resulted in changes or plans to policies. We also asked the mentors, were they likely to host another fellow? And 77% said that they were likely to host another fellow. Um, here's some more quotes from, from fellows that we thought would be interesting to share. 
I'll read them out loud too, since we have a bit of time. Um, it was a chance to do something new, get access to a job I'd never had, and it continues to pay dividends because there are so many alums out there. I personally connected to our science policy work as a foundation because of it. Uh, it was the most valuable experience that I've had to date. It was a true privilege to meet the people I did, get the exposure provided, and serve in the public sector. I think this experience is fantastic for opening one's eyes to the ways in which the government works and what and where the levers are for using science to affect policy and how policy affects science. And this sentiment of the fellowship being able to open people's eyes or become a pivot point for them going forward is really common among what we hear from alums. We also um, asked mentors to give us some free form information. This is the kind of thing we heard from mentors. It lets us bring a different perspective to the kinds of programmatic work we do, and it gives us access to the kind of people who would never otherwise consider coming to work for the government. It isn't the intention of the program for fellows to teach the host anything, but it was great for my office too. We ended up learning so much from our fellows. Honestly, having really smart people who are keen to contribute, keen to learn, and have a really thorough scientific background, it's just amazing. So mentors gave very laudatory remarks as well. And I'll mention that this is something that um, carries through to this day. Um, we just completed our uh, placement process for the incoming class of fellows, and there were um, over twice as many available positions for finalists as we had finalists to place. and a member of the governing board of the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance. And I'm Erin Heath, Director of Federal Relations at AAAS. I also co-chair with Toby the ESEP Coalition and chair the JSPG Governing Board. We're excited to introduce this video feature produced by the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance and AAAS in recognition of our joint call for papers focused on the 75-year anniversary of Vannevar Bush's Science, the Endless Frontier, generously supported by the Kaplan Foundation. This call for papers invites students, postdocs, policy fellows, early career researchers, and young professionals of all academic disciplines to share their ideas for how we can build on the endless frontier framework and shape the future of American science and science policy. A few words about why this is an important time for young people to speak up and make their voices heard on science policy. The report that Aaron referenced by Vannevar Bush was written 75 years ago. It's time to really look and reassess what science policy should look like for the next 75 years. And to do that, we, not, we need the next generation of scientists and those who are looking at science policy to be engaged. To help authors with their writing, JSPG and AAAS have organized a number of free webinars featuring many thought leaders from our organizations and beyond, covering topics as diverse as catalyzing public engagement in science, maximizing the economic and societal impacts of R&D investments, and optimizing U.S. science policy to respond to public health challenges. Learn more at the URL below. This video will elevate voices of early career researchers and professionals in science policy, many of which are in attendance this week, uh, as they share their hopes and dreams for the future of American science and science policy. We'll then hear from AAAS CEO Suda Parikh, National Academy of Sciences President Marsha McNutt, and former White House OSTP and NSF Director Neil Lane, interviewed by JSPG CEO Shailen Jotishi and Chief Outreach Officer Adriana Bankston. Doctors Parikh, McNutt, and Lane will share their ideas for where young people could focus their efforts, in addition to a few kernels of wisdom for shaping science policy. The deadline to submit for JSPG and AAAS's call for papers is April 4th, 2021. Visit the URL below to see the full details. Our papers will be awarded cash prizes. There'll also be outreach funds available to help authors turn their ideas into action. So as you go through the video, engage online with other AAAS meeting attendees and tag your takeaways and thoughts using the handles and hashtags below. On behalf of JSPG and AAAS, we hope you enjoy this video. I dream of a future of American science policy. We dream of a future of American science policy. I dream of a future of American science policy that prioritizes the protection of sacred sites and the preservation and protection of our water and land. That prioritizes fighting racism, patriarchy, 
and oppressive societal norms that prioritizes the human impacts of scientific progress, the well-being of diverse communities, and the health and future of our planet. That prioritizes responsible innovation, that leads through service to others, and empowers the next generation of researchers to reimagine the future of what's possible. A global scientific enterprise that enables discoveries for the common good and is inclusive of researchers from all countries and backgrounds. One that incorporates the next generation of scientists and engineers because we bring innovative and collaborative new perspectives that will shape the future of our field. So science is open, accessible, and inclusive for everyone. Students and early career researchers should have a role in shaping science policy because you have a unique and transformative perspective, not on how science has always been done, but on what science can be. I believe students and early career researchers should have a role in shaping science policy because the hours spent conducting research not only reflects their perseverance for the truth, but also their unparalleled scientific domain knowledge which has the potential to inform the political landscape for the benefit of all. I'm looking forward to a future of science policy engagement at the state and local level, where communities can be directly impacted by evidence-based policies and practices. I dream of a future of American science policy that prioritizes equity over all else. While science is capable of amazing things like the creation of a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine in under a year, it has also been evoked as a way to commit atrocities and disproportionately dehumanize black and brown people. Scientific research and discovery in the U.S. has never been apolitical and has never been equitable. I'm hopeful, though, that this could change. We must decolonize science, rejecting the notion that it is somehow divorced from policy and politics. We must ensure anti-racism is the backbone of STEM education, research funding, and public outreach in the U.S. and worldwide. I hope for the field of science policy to continue evolving into a more interdisciplinary field through the development of cross-sector and cross-disciplinary collaborations. Such progress could better position the field to predict and respond to implications of scientific innovations in the future. Students and early career researchers play an essential role in shaping science policy. We are the future leaders that will leverage science and policy to improve the world. And build a more equitable society and sustainable planet through collaboration and innovation. NSPN sends good luck to all the authors of the JSPG, AAAS, Endless Frontiers writing competition. So good luck to the authors. So I'm sending the best of luck to the authors. I wish the authors of the JSPG, AAAS, Endless Frontier writing competition the best of luck. We cannot wait to see the visions you have for shaping the future of American science and science policy. Best of luck to all the authors. Looking forward to reading all your submissions. We can't wait to see your biggest, boldest, and most forward-thinking ideas for reimagining the scientific and research enterprise, catalyzing disruptive and inclusive innovation, and shaping science and technology policy in the years to come. folks. We heard from early career scientists and engineers and policy professionals from all academic disciplines and walks of life on what they hope will constitute the future of U.S. science and science policy. JSPG and AAAS's joint call for papers is focused on looking back on Vannevar Bush's endless frontier framework and how American science rose to prominence. But we also need to look to the future in order to address the urgent and most important challenges of society today. From a greater focus on maximizing the economic and societal impacts of research to fostering true diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM, there are many ways we can expand and strengthen American science and science policy. In the next segment, Joe and Shayla and I, as we interview members of JSPG's advisory board and other leaders in science policy, to give their advice on where authors can focus their writing efforts. These leaders will also share some kernels of wisdom for how early career leaders can be effective in impacting US science policy. As Toby and Aaron shared in their intro, tweet your takeaways to us using the handles and hashtags below so we can learn and hear from you during the AAAS meeting and beyond. The most prolific and most profound tweeters will be invited to contribute to the cover memo for this joint issue. Thank you for tuning in.
Sudip, thanks so much for taking the time to interview with us today. We're really honored to have you. Sudip Parikh is CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the executive publisher of the Science Family of Journals. Uh, Sudip has spent two decades at the nexus of science policy and business, and we're really pleased to be partnering with AAAS and the Cavalry Foundation for this call for papers focused on the 75-year anniversary of, of Vannevar Bush's Endless Frontiers. Dr. Parikh's bio is available at AAAS.org, and he is on Twitter at Sudip S. Parikh. Sudip, thanks so much for joining us. We're honored to have you. Shailen, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm excited to do this. Absolutely. So, Sudip, you know, JSPG and AAAS, our joint call for papers really focuses on reflecting back on Vannevar Bush's Endless Frontier, getting that historical context, but also thinking about the urgent, important science policy challenges that we're faced with today. With your vantage point at AAAS, What's top of mind for you? What should early career researchers consider um, writing about for this call for papers? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm so glad that we're participating in this as AAAS because, um, frankly, we need uh, we need voices that are different than the ones that have been talking about this stuff for 25 years. Um, and so, uh, this is, you know, when I when I think of what's on top of mind for me, uh, I hope that it aligns with what's top of mind for you. If it doesn't, say that, because uh, frankly, um, you know, there are a lot of folks here in Washington who've been who've been talking about this stuff for a long time and we get set in our ways. So uh, I'm gonna tell you my, you know, my two or three things that are at the top, but uh, but I'd love to hear from um, from you all, from, this, uh, from the audience listening to this. Um, do you think that's true? Do you think it's right? Uh, you can disagree with me. Uh, so first, first is uh, the difference between uh, now and the right after World War II uh, is immense, right? So many things have happened, but what's top of mind for me is the human capital going into the sciences. Um, because we are at this place where um, many nations are joining the United States at the forefront of scientific research. Uh, and that's a good thing, that's a good thing. We want others doing great science. Um, but what it means is it's a competitive landscape and we, we as a nation uh, need to be uh, pulling in people from all across the country, uh, geographically, uh, from every race and ethnicity. Uh, we want uh, you know every gender at the table. Uh, and this is if you look at if you look at the data, we're not doing well at this. We're doing terrible at it, and, and it is going to hold us back because in sheer numbers, we're never going to compete. Uh, in terms of the number of scientists and number of engineers. But when you get the creative boost, the innovation boost that comes from uh, a diverse team, uh, that comes from a diverse thought that is derived uh, from, uh, from diverse experience, um, that is incredibly powerful. It gives you orthogonal solutions that, uh, that, were, uh, that are unexpected. And so I think if, if we don't maximize that, if we don't figure out the ways to do that, um, we're really hurting ourselves as a nation. And frankly, we're hurting the world because the United States needs to be a leader at the forefront of science. Uh, so that is top of mind, absolutely top of mind. And so um, if this, the community that's listening to this, we need some new ideas, okay? Because we've been, it's not like this is a new problem. Uh, the programmatic aspect of AAAS was born out of this exact same question in 1970, 1970. Uh, and so that's why we have the programmatic part of AAAS. Um, we haven't done that well. I mean, we're, look, we're better off than we were uh, in 1970, uh, but we have a long way to go. Uh, and so I think anything that addresses that challenge, and that means how do we retain scientists that are from diverse backgrounds. Uh, how do we, uh, recruitment is one thing, Reten retention is a, is a whole other subject. Um, how do we ensure that, um, uh, that, that we maintain scientific excellence, uh, but that we broaden the aperture of, uh, of what's important in science? Uh, so uh, that is absolutely top of mind. Second for me, and, and I know I'm answering this in a long answer for you, Shailen, so I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short, is to make sure that the support for science in the country remains strong. And that means trusted bonds between the scientific community uh, and the people that support us. Uh, and the, uh, the people that support us are the American citizens who are paying taxes and expect, they expect something uh, for that investment. Uh, and so we can't be completely uh, disconnected from the needs of our communities. Um, and so, uh, you know, whereas in the 19, uh, you know, after 1945, uh, we, we went down this, we are talking about government investment in basic research. We need to do that. But now there's a huge number of partnerships that are possible. 
when I think about the government, I think about philanthropy, I think about industry, um, there is a, uh, an environment out there that did not exist in the 1940s. And so how does that, um, how do we coordinate that effort so that we can solve the big challenges of our time, climate change, uh, food and water insecurity, uh, uh, public health. Uh, we've got to make sure that we are uh, building a, a national strategy that's not just thinking about the government, but that's thinking about the government, these philanthropies, the industry, and then our people, uh, our diverse people. So uh, two big problems. But again, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear from you all. Um, does that comport with your, what you're thinking? Really sound advice there. So to are there any reports, books, papers, just general resources from AAAS or elsewhere that you recommend early career researchers brush up on as they're uh, framing their writing topics and preparing their submissions? Yeah, from AAAS, uh, look, if you're not following Matt Hurahan uh, and his analyses of the, the federal investment in science, uh, you're missing out. Uh, Matt is, he's not just giving the numbers, okay? He's He's thinking through trend analysis. He's thinking through comparisons to other countries. He's thinking through uh, funding models. Uh, so uh, go to the AAAS website, go to the government relations page, and you'll find the budget analysis tools that Matt Hurahan does. Follow him on Twitter. Uh, it is, uh, it's worth your time. Um, uh, I'd also encourage you uh, to, uh, beyond AAAS, um, you know, look to uh, some of the other organizations here in town and in, in DC. Uh, so here, I'm going to take you outside of just the, the, the societies. You know, the scientific societies have done a lot of great work. Uh, any of them uh, have good resources. Let me take you to some things that are outside of that. Um, uh, the Council on Competitiveness. Competitiveness. Um, this is a, uh, a, a group that is, has a lot of business uh, uh, members, uh, has some nonprofits, a lot of university members. Uh, they have put together some terrific reports that are uh, broad beyond um, uh, beyond just a scientific investment, but also uh, uh, policy uh, around uh, both tax policy and also uh, intellectual property. You may not agree with it all, but you need to go out there and look. Uh, look at what's on uh, on Bio's webpage uh, because they've uh, they're also thinking in terms of um, some of their work on diversity is actually really good, really good, really thoughtful. Um, and so let's uh, let's make sure that you're looking uh, at all these possible sources of information, uh, because even if you may not agree with even the majority of what they might be proposing, there are uh, there are pieces. There's a lot of wisdom uh, across the spectrum here in D.C. Uh, find the pieces that work, and then uh, you know create your own uh, create your own uh, sort of thought process. Because it's very easy to get stuck in these molds of yes, I. I sit over here on the political spectrum side. So this is the this is the um, uh, this is the the menu of choices that I have. Uh, don't think of it that way. You are what we need is fresh thinking. Uh, that's the reason for this uh, for this collaboration is looking for that fresh thinking. So that often requires pulling from elsewhere uh, and turning things in a different way uh, so that they can get the outcome that you want and maybe even pull some additional people along with you in terms of supporting it. Absolutely. That's, that's great advice, just tying into the, the industry lens and then also, you know, putting yourself out of your comfort zone and, and thinking outside of the box. Um, so to, to span out a little bit, you know, part of JSPG's mission is also to, to nurture and, and elevate early career voices and, and to help them by way of training and, and professional development. What's a what's a piece of advice that you got when you were first starting out that you might share with others who are looking to build a career in science policy or even just contribute as a as a practice a practicing scientist or engineer? Every policy uh, discussion is about a slippery slope. Every one of them, uh, and everyone will make the slippery slope argument about you shouldn't change because it's a slippery slope and you'll break something. Um, the older I get, the more I realize. You got to try because all policy is a slippery slope, uh, and if you break something, you fix it. Uh, and so, uh, be willing to be willing to to, to take a chance, uh, specifically with you know making a policy recommendation. I mean, how is that? You know, what's the risk uh, other than um, uh, other than not having it implemented? Sudip, I I know we're out of time. Any parting advice for our audience out there looking to reflect on endless frontier and think about? the future of American science and American science policy? Here's what I'll say is that I have been, um, anytime I'm asked about what makes me optimistic, I say that I look at the participation 
of scientists who are at the beginnings of their career right now uh, in policy debates, uh, in engaging with the public. And I see this, um, I see this incredible energy uh, that is out there. And don't lose that. Uh, we, we are in a tumultuous time. We're, we're at a time that uh, uh, of, you know, these, whenever you have these periods of, uh, of uncertainty, it's an opportunity for an inflection. Uh, and it can go either way. It can go either way. And you all have that energy. Don't lose it. Uh, focus it on actually trying to put good policy prescriptions together uh, for the nation and for the world. Uh, do it in a way that is um, uh, not arrogant, but that is confident, confident, uh, not strident, but that is, um, uh, that is uh, seeking to make sure you're uh, transmitting the truth. And if you can do that, and it's a fine line to walk, uh, and we need, like I said, we need 100,000 of you um, uh, to actually do this, uh, I think we're going to make, I think we're going to look back on this period and say this was the beginning of something good. Brilliant parting words. Sudip, thanks so much again for taking the time to interview with us. Sudip Parikh is CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the executive publisher of the Science Family of Journals. He is on Twitter at Sudip S. Parikh. Thanks again so much. Thank you, Shailen. Enjoyed it. Today, I'm honored to be speaking with Dr. Marsha McNutt, president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. From 2013 to 2016, Marsha served as editor-in-chief of the Science Family of Journals. And prior to joining Science, she served as the 15th director of the U.S. Geological Survey. Marsha is also a member of the GSPG Advisory Board. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, so I'm especially excited to talk to you today. Uh, I'm a scientist myself, uh, currently working uh, in science policy and advocacy for research and higher education and topics related to the STEM workforce. So I'm really interested to hear about your, uh, some of the topics that we'll discuss today. To frame this a little bit around JSPG, so I'm currently the Chief Outreach Officer and um, have been involved in organizing events uh, for our issues. And um, a lot of our recent efforts have focused around the uh, 75th anniversary of Vannevar Bush's um, Science Endless Frontier. So uh, just looking at how we might reimagine the future of science and science policy. So with that framing, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the uh, system of incentives and rewards in academia, which I think affects a lot of uh, our, the culture in our universities. Um, so I'm wondering if you could comment on this topic from your current role as president of the National Academies of Sciences. Um, in a panel, I think that you were on in 2019 related to the culture of science, uh, you mentioned that good scientific practices and open access um, should be rewarded for career advancement in academia. And however, I think we're still pretty far from uh, some of this. And um, how do you think we can change the system of incentives and rewards um, to really move the needle in uh, institutions? At my own institution, the National Academy of Sciences, we are now um, discouraging taking gifts for new awards that simply pat researchers on the back for the same kinds of activities that are furthering the status quo. And instead, we are looking for ways to reward people um, for um, activities that actually matter. So one we're working on right now is a um, new prize that will reward researchers that who are involved in communication of science. Because we think this is something else that has previously not been considered something that is part of the typical reward system in science. And yet, uh, basically, it's, it's all part of building trust in what we do. Mm -hmm. So another question um, related to publishing, which of course, uh, publishing is critical to advancing research. And um, I also think the publishing system has changed over time and needs to evolve with some of the um, current uh, open access and preprints. Um, so as from your perspective, as um, having been editor in chief of the science family of journals, um, how do you see uh, journals coexisting with opportunities such as open access, preprints, um, 
and how does this sort of help the careers of young researchers? Uh, that would sort of be the first part. And then um, how can we, as we're discussing communications, how can we make this more digestible um, for the public as well? I view publishing, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, of being a geoscientist, that it um, is actually an ecosystem. And we know from the science of ecosystems that they are strongest and most resilient when they are diverse. And the advent of open access publishing and the um, rise of preprints has actually added to the diversity of the publishing landscape. And I believe it's made it actually much stronger and much more resilient. You know, it used to be back when I started in research, you know, many, many years ago, the community was much smaller. I could get the benefits of what people get today from a preprint server just by sending my paper around. I knew the people in the field who were going to be interested in it. But now science is so much larger. It's so much more international. It's so much more big business. You can't do that anymore. And so preprint servers have stepped in to fill that. They are not, in my view, ever going to entirely replace journals. Right. Um, so now to um, turn to another aspect um, in relation to thinking about science and the pandemic. Um, so it was interesting um, to learn about your role as director of the U.S. Geological Survey. And I know that you previously drew this parallel between the Deepwater Horizon explosion and um, today's pandemic. Um, and as you noted, as both events um, enlist both science and technology to solve a crisis, but there is still a high level of skepticism in science uh, on the part of the public. Um, so how do you think that we can um, restore public trust in science and engage the public in uh, addressing the pandemic? So this is an interesting question because while uh, frequent surveys have shown that there can be public skepticism on some of the more um, partisan issues in science, like climate change or nuclear energy or GMOs. They repeatedly show that there is broad bipartisan support when it comes to public health. And therefore, to see an issue like the pandemic become polarized is, um, is, is really uh, quite uh, remarkable and in my view, almost unprecedented. Um, so with this administration and moving forward, um, how do we ensure that science is really front and center in policymaking and educating leaders um, to really um, make decisions based on evidence? And so it's again, um, one of these issues that if the leaders on down are saying science is important and we're going to use it in our decision making, um, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful that that's indeed what's going to happen. But, but then the onus really comes back to us as scientists to say um, a couple things. First of all, how do we create actionable science for these decision makers? How do we make sure that our science is decision ready for them? Because um, most of the science that we publish in our journals, in our preprints, is useless to them. This is an actionable science. It's not decision ready. And um, we, we have to, um, first of all, uh, train, cultivate, and reward a whole um, group of scientists who are those translators who make the science decision ready. But also we have to think ourselves while we're doing our research, what are the policy implications and how can we communicate them uh, whenever needed? And then secondly, 
uh, in addition to making the science uh, decision ready and actionable, I think we have to think strategically as well. Thank you for that. Uh, there is a lot more we could discuss on this, uh, but I want to just make sure we touch up on the workforce question before um, we end. So, because I think it's really critical to think about how, we're, how we train the next generation of scientists in our institutions, especially now, as you mentioned, with a new administration that would support science. And um, you also mentioned diversity. So obviously, currently, early career researchers from certain backgrounds are still disadvantaged from entering or remaining in the research pipeline. So how do you think that we can stimulate those who are traditionally marginalized in science uh, to continue making breakthroughs and provide them with opportunities to do so? Well, first of all, um, we know that there are some outstanding examples of scientists from underrepresented uh, communities that are contributing to science. And um, they are fabulous role models. And we already know that climate change is disproportionately affecting um, communities of color. We know the same with um, the uh, pandemic. And there are many other things too. And so I think we need to do a better job of showing that science is interested in addressing those problems and supporting them to address those problems. Great. Um, so I know we're out of time. Um, I just want to thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, that was really insightful. Uh, I wish we could discuss discuss more, but um, this is really great for us as well. And hopefully um, you enjoyed the discussion. I did. I did very much. And thank you so much for inviting me. Today, we're very honored to be speaking with Dr. Neil Lane, who is a senior fellow in science and technology policy at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Of his many achievements, Neil has served as director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and science advisor to President Bill Clinton, as well as director of the National Science Foundation, making him one of only two individuals to hold both appointments. We're also very honored to have Neil as a member of the JSPG Advisory Board. Dr. Lane's bio is available at sciencepolicyjournal.org slash advisory board, and the Baker Institute is on Twitter at Baker Institute. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. We're honored to have you. Thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to be here. Neil, you know, JSPG and AAAS's call for papers is really focused on reflecting back on Endless Frontier and understanding the historical context, but also looking forward and engaging students and early career researchers to think about how we can push the envelope and shape a better uh, future of American science and science policy. You know, you've you've been one of only two people to serve as both head of NSF and OSTP. What's top of mind for you right now? If you if you had to recommend a focus, what are some of the most critical science policy challenges that young people should be uh, focused on for this for their writing? Well, of course, the list is long. It's uh, one sits down to think about uh, what these challenges really are. Uh, serious social issues. I mean, uh, we still have racism in the country. We still have discrimination uh, that results in, in bias, that results in, in inadequate opportunities, unfair experiences for people of a different color or, or, or gender or transgender. I mean, uh, we still have those to work on and it'll take a long time, but nonetheless, they're very important. And then there's the whole larger global scene, the importance of immigration. I mean, is America really a place where people can feel welcome to come from all over the world? Because we need those people to come here. In science and engineering, we don't generate enough scientists and engineers from American born, born boys and girls, uh, whatever their background. Uh, we, need, we need to do a better job of that partly our problem in public education and, and just other things about our society and our value system. It's been a really tough uh, election year this past year, and our country is in many ways more divided than ever. And many uh, in, you know, JSPG's networks and many early career researchers, I think it's fair to say, are, are left-leaning or left-of-center. 
you know, you, you shared the sort of uh, call for, you know, early career researchers to be, you know, sharing their ideas for how we can, we can mend across aisles. Um, what advice do you have for authors who are looking to develop science policy solutions that would appeal to a coalition of partners that, you know, they don't normally work with, whether it's Republicans or, or business groups or, or so forth? Well, of course, absolutely right. We need that kind of two-way conversation, dialogue. I mean, you know, reasonable people sitting down and and even willing to uh, to agree to disagree. Um, I wish I knew the right approach that would work for everybody. I don't have that kind of wisdom, but I could offer a few comments just in my own experience because in my in my jobs at NSF and the White House, of course, I had to work with people I didn't agree with, even some I didn't like personally. But you have to put all that aside or you don't make any progress. So there's some things I, uh, that, that personally uh, I, I've, I've come to think were important, at least in terms of my own ability to get anything done. First of all, to know as much as you can about the person or the people you're speaking with. You know, the old, uh, the old adage, you know your audience and try for a dialogue. You have to keep your overall objective of the, of the discussion or the testimony or the conference and the, the speech, whatever. You always have to keep that in mind. But uh, in order to get it across, uh, there are several things you, can, you might try to do. Local examples are terrific. If you can connect your policy topic with uh, something that you, you know people have on their minds or care about or important to the community uh, or the profession or the group, whatever group you're talking about. Um, that's, I always found that was very useful to sort of get people to calm down and, and actually have a conversation. I always try to start a conversation with something that I think we might agree on. You know, we all care about family, friends, children, sports, the weather. It, try to invite the other person to talk first you know, tell me a little bit about yourself or you know, how'd you get into this business or whatever. People by and large like to talk about themselves. And once they start talking about themselves, you're kind of with them. I mean, you, you, you've come along and, and then sometimes they realize they've been talking too much and they'll then be open, much more open to hearing from you. Uh, so, you know, you, you know, once you've heard them out, say climate change, it's a hoax or it isn't bad or we need more, need more carbon or whatever it is. Uh, rather than saying, uh, no, you are wrong. And let me tell you why you're wrong. I mean, that just doesn't work. <laughs> Another approach is I get what you're saying. That let me tell you, let me share with you what I think and just the reason that I feel this way. And then there'll be a back and forth. You can actually sometimes have a conversation. One should try to moderate the discussion somehow. Humor, I think. Humility, a little humility and humor, so long as it's not obviously false, uh, is, uh, I, I think, undervalued. I used it in the White House uh, carefully because, you know, time constraints and, and things going on in the White House. But, but, but it often works. If it really is genuinely self-effacing, I think. Um, with Congress, you have to be a little bit careful with the humor because the senators really want to make the jokes and get the laughs. They're not interested in the witnesses making the jokes and getting the laughs. So if you're going to use humor there, it needs to be humor that really um, uh, reflects positively on whoever it is sitting at the table. Uh, about speaking and writing, I learned a long time ago that less is often more. Uh, you know, when in doubt, throw it out, the old saying. Uh, I have a hard time with that. I write have a hard time. It's easy for me to write long. It's tough for me to write short. And so, so often what I do is I write longer and then I am brutal and I indent a chunk of it in blue with the thought I'm going to throw it out, but I'm not quite ready to throw it out. Anyway, everybody has their own style. Absolutely. Those are great tips and really aligned with JSPG because, you know, we, we, we are sort of pracademic. We're in between academia and then the world of policy and practice. So, um, and then, you know, to sort of span out a bit, uh, Neil, you know, looking back at your career, you've, you've been able to hold so many, you know, illustrious positions. 
you know, many of our authors are at the start of their careers or they're wanting to have impact. They're wanting to have a, a meaningful contribution. What's a piece of advice that you got when, when you were first starting out that you might share with, with others who were, who are now looking to build their own careers in, in wanting to be effective in science policy? A couple of things come to mind. One is, uh, I, I do remember when President Clinton asked me to leave the National Science Foundation after five years. Either he liked what I was doing or he didn't. But anyway, he asked me to come to the White House as science advisor in 1998. And so I had lunch with a friend, uh, a man named William Golden or Bill Golden, uh, a uh, wealthy uh, uh, investor and uh, philanthropist who really loved science and did so much for science through his uh, philanthropy and who actually worked for a while in the White House back in the Truman days, I think, and wrote a memo, was one of his jobs, was, he was very young in the, in the military at that time, wrote a little memo about what science advice should look like in the White House. It was a very, very important contribution. And so I kept up with Bill Golden over the, over the years. And, and so I, knowing he worked in the White House and just he was a very wise man, I just said, you know, how do you work in the White House, Bill? And he said, well, Neil, when you were a little boy, he's always talking about when you're a little boy. Uh, of course, Bill Golden sadly died a number of years ago at an old age. He said, Bill, and he said, Neil, when you were a little bit of boy, you remember looking through the microscope at a slide that had an amoeba on it and an ink blot. And you watched the amoeba crawl along. And when he got to the ink blot and touched it, he pulled back and, and then, and then the amoeba would crawl in a little bit different direction, bump into the ink and pull back and then a little bit different pull back. And so just keep doing that until the amoeba got around the ink block. Bill said, that's how you work in the white house. So always remember that great kernels of wisdom and, and uh, so many of those. Um, so to close out, Neil, you know, our early career researchers or audience, they're, they're going to be looking for resources recommended readings, books, text. Um, are there any resources you'd recommend that our authors uh, look into as they prepare their submissions? So one thing I would urge your students in early, clear, early career scientists to do is to, is to read a number of articles because uh, my sense is the JSPG standards are really quite high. And so you can learn a lot by what's past muster in the past. And uh, uh, I can mention a few things that I'm writing or have written with, with co-authors, of course. Uh, things mainly to try to influence policymakers. Uh, and so if you're interested, in, if the students are interested in seeing any of these, one of them is a report that called The Perils of Complacency, uh, America at a Tipping Point in Science and Engineering. And this is a joint report coming out from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a place you know well, and uh, the Baker Institute, Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. It's really an update of an earlier report that the Academy put out. Uh, it was released at the end of September, and you can find an executive summary or, and the full report. Uh, you can find the links online. You can just Google them, actually, perils of complacency, and it will come up. Uh, recently, you know, turning more to like this week or earlier or last week, uh, Norm Augustine and I, Norm Augustine co-chaired the study committee of the earlier report I talked about. Uh, many will know Norm, but not necessarily the younger audience. He was CEO and chairman of Lockheed Martin for many years, and he's done extraordinary uh, pro bono work for the science community, the National Academy's report, the famous Gathering Storm report of 2005 and 10, something like that. Anyway, Norm and I wrote an op-ed that appeared, I don't know, yesterday, I think, anyway, very recently in this uh, congressional uh, news outlet called The Hill. And that, that piece is called, uh, titled, the editors gave it a title, Chinese Innovation is Surging. We Must Fund Science to Compete. Thanks so much for that. Dr. Neil Lane is a senior fellow at the Baker Institute for Public Policy and a member of the JSPG Advisory Board. Thanks again so much for joining us, Neil. Very much appreciated. Thank you for having me, Sean. 
On behalf of JSPG and AAAS, we thank you for tuning into our video. Vandiver Bush's Endless Frontier Framework was written in an entirely different era and society than which we find ourselves in. American science is exceptional and special, but there are many ways that we can improve upon and strengthen U.S. science policy for the betterment of the nation and the world. We hope this short film has been informative and inspiring, and we invite all students, postdocs, policy fellows, early career researchers, and young professionals to submit for our joint call for papers focused on shaping the future of U.S. science policy. For more senior leaders, please share our call for papers through your networks and consider co-authoring a piece with your junior colleagues. The deadline to submit for JSPG and AAAS's joint call for papers is April 4th, 2021. We look forward to learning from you and hearing your ideas through the call for papers and on Twitter. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the AAAS annual meeting. Hi, I'm Toby Smith, Vice President for Policy at the Association of American Universities and Co-Chair of Engaging Scientists and Engineers in Policy and a member of the Governing Board of the Journal of Science, Policy and Governance. And I'm Erin Heath, Director of Federal Relations at AAAS. I also co-chair with Toby the ESEP Coalition and chair the JSPG Governing Board. We're excited to introduce this video feature produced by the Journal of Science Policy and Governance and AAAS in recognition of our joint call for papers focused on the 75 year anniversary of Vannevar Bush's Science, the Endless Frontier, generously supported by the Kaplan Foundation. This call for papers invites students, postdocs, policy fellows, early career researchers, and young professionals of all academic disciplines to share their ideas for how we can build on the Endless Frontier framework and shape the future of American science and science policy. A few words about why this is an important time for young people to speak up and make their voices heard on science policy. The report that Aaron referenced by Vannevar Bush was written 75 years ago. It's time to really look and reassess what science policy should look like for the next 75 years. And to do that, we, not, we need the next generation of scientists and those who are looking at science policy to be engaged. To help authors with their writing, JSPG and AAAS have organized a number of free webinars featuring many thought leaders from our organizations and beyond, covering topics as diverse as catalyzing public engagement in science, maximizing the economic and societal impacts of R&D investments, and optimizing U.S. science policy to respond to public health challenges. Learn more at the URL below. This video will elevate voices of early career researchers and professionals in science policy, many of which are in attendance this week. Uh, as they share their hopes and dreams for the future of American science and science policy. We'll then hear from AAAS CEO Suda Parikh, National Academy of Sciences President Marsha McNutt, 